Hi and welcome to the Guna Art Museum's 8th Annual Art and Nature Celebration. I'm Malcolm Warner, I'm the director of the museum. Um, behind me is this year's specially commissioned artwork. Uh, each, each time we um, invite an artist to create a large outdoor piece like this uh, to um, be the centerpiece, as it were, for the Art and Nature Celebration. Um, and this year it's by a, a group called Poetic Kinetics, led by Patrick Schoen and the title of the work is Sunset Trace. Anyway, Patrick will be speaking about this piece uh, at this same time tomorrow evening, so please tune in for that. He'll talk about his work and his work specifically on this project. Well, another of the main ingredients of Art and Nature is the keynote lecture. Um, we've had some incredibly distinguished speakers to deliver that lecture in the past, uh, including Kevin Starr, the leading California historian, and uh, Martin Kemp, the world's authority on Leonardo da Vinci. And um, it's in the nature of uh, art and nature, so to speak, um, that we're especially interested in speakers who cross disciplines. And no one more fully fits that bill than today's uh, speaker, Dan Goods. Um, he was trained as a graphic designer, and now he's visual strategist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, you could be forgiven, for wondering if such a job could even exist. But I think when you've heard Dan speak, you'll see the, what great sense it makes. Um, he leads an amazing team developing creative ways to foster uh, an awareness and appreciation of the wonders of science for the public. And for that, he's been honored with NASA's Exceptional Public Service Award. So it's my pleasure to introduce him to deliver this year's Art and Nature keynote lecture, Dan Goods. Hello, it's great to be with you guys tonight. I, I wish that I could actually be there in person with you, but obviously this is a different world and so we got to do different things. Uh, but I hope that you're having a great day. Um, you know, as, as we all have kind of dealt with, uh, or many of you guys know, California has had a really hard time with fires uh, recently. And uh, I live in Altadena. Um, right near the Rose Bowl, and this is uh, sort of a, a map of the Bobcat fire a little while ago. Thank you to all the first responders, all the firemen, all the people involved in uh, keeping us safe, um, and especially for uh, Mount Wilson Observatory, you did an amazing job uh, saving that, that historic uh, special location. But in the process of this, um, I've never had this happen before where we got a text from uh, the county or the city uh, saying that you're in a, a zone that you might have to evacuate. And we were like, oh my goodness. And, and so you got to pack up, right? Um, but we, um, our big car, our van had actually gotten totaled. So we only had a smaller uh, car. We have three kids and we have a bunch of chickens that um, we're not allowed to leave. And so we didn't have very much space. And so we're kind of going through all of our boxes and trying to figure out what are we going to keep because we could only keep, you know, like a couple boxes. That's all that would fit in a car. And I came across this photo and uh, this photo is myself and one of my great mentors, Roland Young. Uh, who uh, taught at Art Center College of Design. Uh, that's where I went to, uh, to art school. And um, man, when I saw this picture, I, I knew I had to save it because he really changed my life. He, he's one of those kinds of people that, I don't know if you've met someone like this before, but I, I hope that you have. They're the kind of people that can see deep inside your soul and see the things that are inside of you that you have no idea about and then just like rip it out of you and for a moment, you know, put it in front of your face and, and you go, oh, that's who I actually am. That's what I'm supposed to do. And uh, so, so that was my experience with him. I was trying to do a branding exercise. I studied graphic design and normally you would do like logos and posters and stuff like that. And uh, there's this little grocery store that's in Eagle Rock and it's called Galco's, and they sell 500 kinds of soda. And I uh, remember trying to do what a good graphic designer is supposed to do is a logo, but I'm awful at logos. That's not really my strong suit. And so I was struggling, and he looked at me, and he's like, Dan, you are too practical. You know, you just need to go play uh, because you are so practical that you'll take the impractical things that you do, and you'll make them practical. And, uh, you know, I had to kind of think about that. What does that mean? <laughs> but he told me to go play. 
So Galco's again is um, this grocery store and they sell 500 kinds of soda, but they're all in glass bottles. And that's really important because the glass bottle is what makes it good because they use sugar cane instead of corn syrup and the bottle, you know, it just doesn't leach uh, aluminum into it. And so I started to play with bottles and because uh, that was the essence of this place. And so, you know, I'd kind of light them up in different ways and I thought, oh, maybe you could put these on top of his building so you would see it as you drove by. Um, but I love the way in which a bottle will make a sound when you blow on it. So I thought, well, what if I put these bottles on top of my car? What if I drove around? And um, I don't know if you can read it there, but it says does not work. It looks pretty cool though. And eventually, you know, I'd have a friend kind of push it up and down and that didn't work either. But eventually I got the right angle and the right distance and it made this beautiful noise. And it'd go, woo, 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 woo. And I thought, oh man, you know, what if we make a taco truck stand, put all these bottles on it and it'd make music just like an ice cream truck driving by. And then I showed that to one of my friends and uh, she has perfect pitch. And she went around to all these different bottles that I had and she made a scale, a musical scale. And, and I don't know anything about music, but I thought, wow, this is really cool. You know, what if we could make a pipe organ? And so uh, I had no idea how to make a pipe organ and, and I don't know anything about music, but I thought this would be a cool idea. And uh, so anyways, I ended up talking to a lot of people and, and it's usually the way I work is that I have no idea how to do anything <laughs> that I wanna do. But, but when I find an idea that I think is beautiful, that could be impactful, that could be meaningful in some way, you know, I really try to find those people that can help you accomplish those things. And, and I, I find personally that I can, find, I can do way more things with a team than I can ever imagine doing all by myself. So that was one of the big turning points in my life was it was thinking about play and uh, experimentation. And um, there was a moment when uh, a friend of mine wrote me up and, and he said, Dan, there's going to be a, um, uh, uh, a public art um, a call for qualifications at the San Jose airport. San Jose airport was, um, had this big airport being built and, uh, there was a big art program, which is really cool. And they had this hanging sculpture that was going to be like the centerpiece of, of the airport. And I told him, you know what? I mean, nobody has a clue who I am. I've never done public artwork. I've never done a hanging sculpture. How in the world am I going to, you know, why would they pick me? And he said, no, no. And he's the kind of person that wins every one of these. His name is Ned Kahn. And if you look at his work, he, he wins every public art project that he, he gets a part of. Um, but he said, I'm not going to be around. You should do it. And so I thought, okay, he told me to do it. So I, I called up a couple of friends of mine, uh, Nick Hoffermas and Aaron Koblen. And uh, somehow the city picked us to do it. <laughs> and uh, I was like, wow, this is really crazy. And so um, what happened was we then started to think about the sky and what would we want in an airport. And, and you know, there's clouds. And to me, like, that's, that's the most beautiful part of flying is that moment when you're kind of flying through the clouds. And, and you'll notice through my presentation, this has never been something that I have thought about. But now looking back, especially even putting this presentation together is that uh, clouds and things that are transparent and uh, sort of, you know, a little bit hard to see through are, are things that sort of make their way into the work that I do, uh, whether I'm thinking about it consciously or not. And so we thought, well, what if we could create a cloud? And um, now this is San Jose, so it's the gateway to Silicon Valley, and um, it needs to be digital. But the problem with digital is that um, you know, as soon as you make something, it's out of date. You know, you have a screen uh, that's HD and tomorrow it's 4K, next day it's 8, 8K, you know, it's whatever. Uh, everything in digital uh, changes every six months. And so how do you create something that has, you know, a digital aspect to it that can last uh, the test of time? And so we we're trying to figure out these two hard things. How do you make a cloud and how do you make um, something like this that's more digital. And so here we are, this is um, Dan on the left and Nick Hoffermas in the center and Aaron Koblen on, on the right and amazing, amazing people. You should look them up. They have great work. Um, and so we found this thing called liquid crystal. And uh, when you have no electricity, it's opaque, but if you add electricity, it becomes transparent. And so you just kind of switch it back and forth. And so we thought, wow, this is going to be beautiful. What if we hang thousands of these things up in the rafters and uh, run patterns through them and it could become 
this cloud. And so Aaron Koblen, uh, who's an amazing uh, software uh, technical uh, developer as well as artist and thinker, um, he, he put this thing together real quick and all of a sudden we knew that we had something to play with. What if we had sheets of grids of these things? And then, you know, well, how big could this thing be? Uh, how do you arrange these things? These things are not cheap, and so how in the world do you, uh, how many of them can you have up there before you break the budget? Uh, how many do you need later on in case something breaks? Uh, we, we set up all sorts of weird little prototypes. Um, at one point, we ended up, we had to hook up a light bulb to every single panel that we had, and that, um, that turned out not to be very efficient because <laughs> uh, we were actually trying to make this thing really low power. And if we had, you know, 3,000 light bulbs in the back corner somewhere, that probably wasn't going to be very helpful. Um, oh, yeah, this is a little video showing, showing the little lights flashing on and off. Uh, but eventually we found someone that knew how to deal with really low power electronics because uh, to switch these things with just, you know, make it gradate really beautifully, you need to use just little bits of power. And so they ended up making us these uh, custom circuit boards for all these. And um, it's great to even have our, our, the name of the project on there. And then this was our moment. This was the first time that we'd actually gotten to see a decent array of these things and we saw it and we went oh my goodness you know this is going to be beautiful um it's only a couple of different layers but we could imagine what it would be you know if it were really large so that was a great moment then we had to do all the you know dealing with the engineering and how do you hang these things so that there isn't a gigantic structure everywhere how do you deal with all the power you know power only will go so far and uh, i made this little um you know, little uh, mock-up in, in my garage with uh, uh, kind of showing what it might look like, uh, drawings from Nick Hoffermas, uh, trying to figure out, well, man, there's a lot of cables. How do you, how thick are all these cables going to be? Are you going to end up only seeing cables and not the actual pieces that we want to uh, deal with? And then, like, how do we assemble this thing? Because we're in L.A., that's in San Jose, so we actually assembled it um, sort of north of the 210 uh, in a warehouse, and we had this big uh, uh, jig down below to kind of say, okay, well, we didn't want a square cloud. I mean, what, what cloud is square, right? And so we, we had all these different um, amounts of, of pixels that would be there. And, uh, but the problem is we had to do it all with the protective covering. So we never actually got to see the full thing put together until we were done until it was actually installed. And so we just had to hold on to that memory of that moment at which we could actually see it uh, working. And so this is uh, Jamie Barlow. He had to go through every single pixel and map it to software. And so he'd, he'd be like, okay, click number 2B. Okay, it works. 2C, uh, no, it's the wrong one. 2D. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, poor guy, we, we thank him so much for going through all that. Uh, this is Aaron Koblen having to do a little bit of coding on the, um, on the actual hardware that we'd be using, the computer, because the computer that we'd put in for a long-term installation is not the normal computer that you would have on your, on your desktop. And so his screen was literally like, you know, three inches <laughs> big trying to do coding, last-minute coding. Uh, and then it had to be trucked up there. So how do you do that? You know, someone had to make a custom um, uh, box for it all. And this is sort of how we hung it. You know, there'd be a, a lift and, um, and then we'd, we'd take each, each uh, segment, bring it up. Our, you know, hearts are in our throats every time because we're afraid that it's all going to fall and break or how are we going to you know, what's going to happen if we do break some of these things. But eventually it became this, um, you know, really big uh, thing. Here are the final circuit boards. We put a little bit of plastic around them so they wouldn't, um, you know, wouldn't get too dusty. Even the, the cabling was really, really important because we didn't want little knots in it. And we had to find the perfect kind of cabling that we could get in gigantic bolts. Like, I can't remember how long it was, but the bolt was like, two miles worth of cable. And I wish we could have gotten a picture of it because uh, each, each pixel needed to have two wires going to it, going all the way up to the circuit boards. And so that was the first time that I actually turned on. That was the first moment we actually got to see it when it's installed, right? And that's not, that, that uh, terrifies you. 
but eventually uh, this is what it um, oops there we go this was the final installation and so what's happening is that we get live data from a uh, hundred different cities in the world and the weather in those cities affect the patterns that you see and so there's a screen that uh, says, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is Honolulu and it's 77 degrees and it's raining, you know, or slightly raining or some other city. And so if it's raining, it'll look like it's raining. If it's thunder and lightning, it'll flash and look like it's lightning. If it's uh, LA, it looks like it's broken because it just sits there <laughs> because you know our weather. Um, and it turned out to be this really beautiful thing. And, and surprisingly enough, it has lasted the test of time. It's been there quite a few years now, and none of these have burned out. Um, the only thing that's happened is that uh, someone who was mopping the floor uh, smashed into the, uh, the, 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 the computer screen that kind of shows you all the, uh, uh, the cities, but uh, they've been able to take care of that. So it was a big team of people, lots of people working really hard to make this just the perfect type of thing. And that was what was so great about this, this project was that, you know, we, we had the people, we had the, um, we had the art commission on our side, but even more importantly, we had the construction people on our side. We had the developers, we had the architects and uh, the airport and having all of them on board is super important because you know when when a construction person is finishing up the project they're they're exhausted they won't want to be doing this anymore and they're like oh man we got to do the art piece whatever um it's great that they are there and going oh yeah we need that thing to look amazing because we know it's going to be representative of our work as well so that was a really special moment to be able to have that all put together so um a couple of years later uh i got a call from a company, it was a corporation that was gonna build a brand new building and it was gonna be a, a new headquarters for them and they, they were really gonna pull out all the stops. And so one of the things they did is they had an art program where they hired a consultant and they're gonna have artwork and this, it was a huge building. And uh, they said, okay, we have this hallway and we want you to do something just like the eCloud there. And we're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. Um, and, uh, but once we got there, what makes the eCloud work, what makes that liquid crystal work is that when there's a lot of ambient light, it allows the on and off states to be very obvious. Uh, but when it's kind of dark, it doesn't work. And it turned out that this hallway actually ended up being a pretty dark space. And so I was like, well, first off, you don't have the budget for it. Uh, second off, um, it's really dark and, and you're not going to like it. And, and it took a little while. So eventually they said, OK. Uh, so we started to come up with uh, I worked with David Delgado on this project and uh, we, we do a lot of projects together. And so um, we started to come up with a bunch of ideas and we spent like two or three months coming up with ideas and literally four days before we were supposed to do our final presentation, we got a phone call and they said, you know, we've been talking to the architects and, and um, rethinking this space and we don't really think that there should be a hanging sculpture. And we're like, Okay, okay, and there was something about the integrity of the plane of the of the ceiling, and I didn't quite understand it, but that was really important to, you know, it would ruin the entire building if there was a hanging sculpture here, even though they'd asked for one. Uh, so then we're like, okay, well, maybe we could do something on the wall, and they're like, well, we don't really want something on that wall, and then we're like, what about the other? Well, we don't really want anything on that wall, <laughs> and they're like, okay, that's your, that's your brief nothing on the ceiling nothing on the walls what can you do <laughs> and so we're like oh my goodness and so we didn't know what to do but we had been playing around and one of the things about this company that they wanted to express is things about purity things about um, nature things about water water was important to them and so we, we we had a few days to come up with an idea and this is something that happens to me all the time. I'm outside, I'm drinking some water, and I have a, a clear cup, and I look down at the refraction on the table. 
And I'm mesmerized by that. I always am. And, and my friends look at me funny. They're like, what are you looking at? And I'm like, don't you see this? And <laughs> so uh, David and I were like, well, what if we could do something like that? Because then theoretically, nothing physical is actually on the wall. What if we, what if we were just like, you know, shining light on the wall. Maybe that's different. That way we're not actually physically putting anything on it. And if we're above the ceiling, the light is coming from above the ceiling, then we don't have a hanging sculpture. So maybe that would work. And so uh, we kind of pitched the idea. They kind of let us uh, continue playing. So we made a little bit larger container. Uh, here's David Delgado. He's hanging um, a big uh, theater light up there trying to see what would happen. Eventually we got a bigger tank and um, more space and we saw something really, really beautiful happen. And depending on the way that you agitated the water, it would make these beautiful, beautiful patterns. And so this is really just a stick going along one edge of the, um, of the pool. And we're kind of tapping it. It's actually a fiberglass. Think of it like a, um, a fishing pole, maybe. Uh, it's actually something that you shove up uh, conduit that you, uh, wires up conduit that you would get at, at Home Depot. And so we're like, wow, this is super beautiful and mesmerizing. And it really does everything that they were asking for. Uh, we also, uh, this is David again, um, turned out that pool noodles were like, um, critical to our project. <laughs> and so our wives are like, why are you guys buying pool noodles? And we're like, oh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And so it'd make these great patterns because the first one was really active, but this one, uh, the pool noodle is much more uh, calm. And uh, then we're like, well, how do we simulate the, the process of moving a pool noodle? <laughs> and and uh, we didn't we didn't know we thought well, maybe we could have a robot because I'm not going to stand up there all the time doing this, um, and we couldn't find a roboticist. Um, but we found this guy who uh, was a lighting expert, and he was like, you know what? If you bought one of these DJ lights, you take out the light, it has all the movement that you need to do you know back forth up down, and we're like, no way, and so. Uh, we bought one of those things and then he programmed it. We got rid of the light and we put a PVC pipe on the end and all of a sudden it worked just like the pool noodle. And this is like amazing. So we were super excited about this. And um, then, then we had to figure out how in the world are we gonna get this up in the ceiling? Uh, there's all this uh, you know, ceiling tiles and things. How do you, how do you deal with it? And how, how large of a throw can we get onto the wall? Cause that's really important. And um, eventually we, we, uh, we didn't end up hanging it like this. They actually physically attached it to um, the, the wall there. Uh, but just to kind of show that there's two edges. And, and uh, so there's two little platforms and that's where the, the light would be. And then there's two little edges where the light wasn't going to hit. And that's where we could put like a water filtration system so it doesn't turn green and, and uh, keep the water moving and, and clean. So um, this is uh, this is day of installation, um, trying to make the the tray super clean. But this this spot up here was just absolutely insane to try to do anything in. And there's like all these pipes, and we got to like have the light exactly in the right spot, and it was going to be really hard. But somehow somehow we ended up getting in there and being able to put it in just the right spot. And I'll play this video. This is the uh, the final two. And it ended up being like you, you didn't even realize that it was where it was coming from. It was somehow in the ceiling, but you couldn't see the light. And one thing that we found, we've done this, so this is a permanent installation, but we've also done it at um, uh, museums in the past, is the people want to come up and touch it, which is really fascinating. They want to touch the wall. And some people will lay on the ground and let the, the light sort of fall all over them. And it almost feels like a spiritual experience in a way. 
Now they wanted it to be really calming and soothing because that sort of fit their brand. So it's it's not ever going to get super crazy like uh, in some of our tests, but someday we want to do that. And actually what we really want to do is we want to do these on like three giant, you know, buildings, you know, 15 story buildings outside and then have them be connected in some way so that we could, um, you know, like our move our hand, you could move your hand over some water and it would activate it going from one building to the next building to the next building. Again, just a couple of process pictures. So uh, these are, uh, everything I've talked about so far is, is uh, oh, one, one last thing I want to say is, um, if you've ever heard of music, music, um, it's, it's an amazing um, creative uh, theater uh, with music and dancers. Uh, we were asked to sync our playing with this, uh, with, with this, um, with this water and light to uh, on the waterfront and they had a whole group of dancers dancing and a whole orchestra playing it. And um, this is uh, David and I in a garage practicing. And you can hear how it's really calm at that moment, but at other moments, it gets really active. So anyways, we ended up doing this whole um, uh, piece with uh, On the Waterfront and uh, syncing it to that. So that was a lot of fun. So everything I've talked about so far are things that I've done uh, on my own uh, or uh, me as an individual. Uh, but I do work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. It's uh, by the Rose Bowl. I live right next to it. And um, I get to lead an amazing team of artists and designers and creative people. Uh, we talk about doing a couple different things. We, we talk about helping people think through their thinking. So we run a lot of brainstorms and uh, just ask engineers and scientists and people trying to win new missions uh, more about their projects, uh, trying to come up with ways of communicating it in, in uh, layman's terms and also just powerful, interesting ways. Um, and then we also do this thing that we call uh, helping uh, uh, sneaking up on learning. And the idea of creating something that's beautiful and mysterious and uh, you just want to go up and, and try to understand more. And so then you're in the mindset for learning. And um, these next two projects are things that um, uh, have done at JPL. And again, uh, this was um, a trip that I took with David Delgado. He works at JPL as well. And we went out to a place called Goldstone. It's uh, almost, uh, it's halfway to... Las Vegas, if you're in Los Angeles, and out in the middle of the desert, there's these antennas, and there's three locations around the world that there are these gigantic antennas. One's in Australia, one's in Spain, in Madrid, and one's in Goldstone, and they're equidistant around the Earth. And the reason why that's important is that when we're trying to speak to spacecraft that are far away, the Earth is spinning, and if we're trying to talk to it, and the earth has spun too far in the wrong direction, we can't speak to it anymore. And so if we have three of them equidistant, then we can always be able to talk to the spacecraft there in the sky. And so we are out there in the middle of the desert. It's super quiet out there. And we have two thoughts. One, one is that, um, you know, we know that there are spacecraft out there, but we can't see them. But what if we could hear them? What if we could, what if much like you hear a bird flying across the sky, what if you could listen to the location of a, of a satellite? You know, what if, uh, because most of the time we do everything very, you know, visual, what if we could use a different sense? And then the other thought is all this data is coming down, but you don't see it, right? It just, it looks like it's empty. And, um, and so like, is there some way to communicate that? Well, right after this trip, JPL um, uh, budgets got slashed and like everything I wanted to do kind of got put on hold. <laughs> but eight to 10 years later, I finally got to 
work on these projects. And so this is our mission control at JPL. And all the data that goes to and from spacecraft, they're at the moon or beyond, and there's like 40 of them, uh, whether they're from the U.S. or the European uh, Union or the uh, Japanese, lots of different countries. I get a live feed from that room. And so when lights are coming down, that means that, that at this second, we're receiving data from a spacecraft. And when lights go up, that means at that second, we're sending data to a spacecraft. And the more light that you see represents more data, and the less light represents less. And every 20 seconds, we listen to a different antenna, and the, um, whatever it's speaking to is going to be shown. And so we still talk to Voyager, even though it's 46 years old, something like that. Um, uh, but it can hardly send any data back and forth, so it sort of looks like it's broken too, right? Uh, but then other spacecraft can send lots and lots of uh, uh, data back and forth. And so... Uh, this is in the main administration building at, at JPL. It's where the director walks in every day, and so we, we call it the pulse. It, it's like um, it's it's our way of sort of seeing the the pulse of exploration at this moment. And then we made a tiny baby version for the director when he when he retired recently. Now the other project that came out of that is remember I I talked about listening to things and uh, listening to spacecraft. Well, there was an opportunity that um, NASA wanted to tell people that we let people know, remind them that we study the Earth. Most people don't realize that. You know, most people think of NASA as doing something off in deep space, but we actually have 19 satellites that are studying the Earth. It's studying carbon dioxide, um, how high the oceans are, uh, earthquakes, storms, hurricanes, all that sort of stuff, helping us understand where we are. And so uh, uh, we had this idea of, well, what if we could listen to all these uh, wherever they happen to be, the exact location of where they happen to be. And so uh, we ended up working with uh, a guy named Shane Mirbeck, who um, is an audio engineer and a composer. And uh, we created this system of speakers. It's sort of like surround sound on steroids, so that wherever you hear a sound, that's the exact location of one of these Earth satellites going around the Earth. Uh, but then David Delgado had this great insight. He was like, you know, if we, if we do something like this and have a press release and we sh have a picture of a whole bunch of speakers, nobody's going to come. <laughs> you know, there's some audiophiles out there that will like it and, and be excited about it. But like, I don't know, a bunch of speakers usually isn't the most, you know, captivating thing. And, and uh, so, so he said, we need an object of wonder. And so we called up uh, an architect that we, we knew, Jason Klamoski, and he came up with this amazing idea. He said, um, what if it's a seashell? You know, like when you listen to a seashell, you hear the ocean, but in your seashell, you hear satellites from, you know, going around the earth. And so he ended up making this beautiful piece. This is at the Huntington Gardens right now. It's, it's a pretty... Uh, um, it, it was only meant to be there for a few months, but it's been there for a few years now. Uh, so we're excited that this is, this is here. And um, when you go through, you hear different sounds. And there's a different sound for each satellite. So there's 19 different s sounds, uh, all sort of saying hello. So one will say hello over here, another one will say hello over there. that moment there you may have heard some voices uh, that one represents the International Space Station because that's the only satellite up there that actually has people on it and so uh, what was really great about this piece is that normally with data pieces they tend to be a little bit more frenetic uh, but this one people go in and, and close their eyes they meditate in there uh, people bring their uh, crying children in there <laughs> you know and and so it's um, it's been neat to be able to go over there and and uh, interact with people and kind of hear what they learn about and I just wanted to show you um, that data is publicly available 
and I'm going to switch over. Just um, If you Google eyes or you just go eyes.nasa.gov, you can, there's a tool, a little piece of software that you can download. Pretty soon it's all going to be online, but right now you have to download the software. It's all the same software, uh, so you don't need to download it three times. But there's one that's about everything that we're doing on Earth, things that we're doing in the solar system, and then all the planets that we're finding around other stars. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this real fast. So this is eyes on the Earth, and these are all the satellites. And if you click on the button down here, it'll show you where they are at this second. So you can kind of look around. You can go, oh, that's where that one's at. Um, Landsat 8, you could go, uh, you can click on it. You can come and, and uh, see how big it is and where it's at. And then these things are kind of fun. You can say, well, how big is it compared to a scientist? Oh, well, there's a scientist. You know, it's about that big. What if you want to compare it to a school bus? Oh, well, it can almost fit within a, a school bus. But if you go back, you know, not all of them are that size. You know, there's, um, I think, let's try this. Uh, where are we at? Go over here. If you go to M cubed, This is a tiny spacecraft. It's called a CubeSat. It's really, really tiny. So it's amazing that we're, you know, working with things like that. Now, just seeing where they are is one thing, but what's really cool is you can click on these buttons up here and you can get the most recent data that NASA has on, um, uh, on these different types of um, things that we're, we're uh, learning about, whether it's carbon dioxide, whether it's, uh, and, and you can look at it over time you can see how carbon monoxide is. And that's uh, a lot of that comes from fires. And so you can see, you know, uh, slash and burn type of uh, moments. You can actually see it even worse. So this is uh, in 2015, you can see it was a really bad year where um, when, when people are cutting down the, the forests and burning them, you know, it, it uh, produces so much carbon monoxide. But anyways, you can go through here, you can look up all sorts of different data sets, look at them again over time, you can look at all the different uh, missions. So I just encourage you to, uh, you know, uh, poke around with eyes on the Earth as well as the solar system. You can go to all the different planets. And then the exoplanets is really great because you can go to planets that are around other stars. And that's an exciting area as well. So I'm going to quit that and then go back into here. So um, again, the, these uh, last two projects are things that I've done at JPL. Uh, now I'm going to go back to a couple of projects that I've done outside of JPL. And um, you know, sometimes you end up getting you you have um, funny ways of getting into projects. Uh, I was actually asked to do a birthday card for someone and it turned into an installation. And uh, she was a person that loved water. Again, there's another water thing. And uh, we were gonna do, this again was with David Delgado. We were gonna hang these um, scrims outside of her house for her birthday. Uh, she has sort of a little forest in her back, backyard and we were going to project whales flying around in her backyard. That was gonna be really exciting, but it got really cold right before the day we were supposed to do it. So there was literally like, three days before and she's like we have to do everything inside we can't do it outside so what are we going to do well she had these amazing bay windows and i thought what if we hung a sheet outside her back window and clamp it to her gutters and then use a projector and project inside maybe it would look like a uh, an aquarium inside and so this is actually what happens so people come in here for dinner and um, they think they're going to look outside and then all of a sudden there's a giant tortoise flying by uh, <laughs> swimming by or you know there'll be whales or you know lots of different fish but it's it's just kind of um it, it's fun to be able to see what you can do in a short amount of time with little resources uh because some sometimes you're fortunate enough to get to have a lot of resources to do something other times you don't and um actually most of the time you don't maybe i'll i'll put it that way most of the time you don't so this was a lot of fun to do and really what made it work was that the bay windows really they are windows right and so 
you're supposed to look out into something, and in this particular case, it just looks like you're looking out into the ocean. Another um, another project that sort of deals with clouds. So we had the eCloud early on, and um, uh, we're coming near the end here. But um, this is a, a project that I've been tinkering with for a long, long time. Uh, but I love I love fog, and there's uh, this isn't like the fogger that you you have at a rave or something like that. This is actually water that's being uh, shook so hard that it turns into a mist. And if you fill a room and you light it from behind, you do feel like you are on that, that moment where you're just above the clouds on a sunset, you know, flying back to Los Angeles. And um, this is an installation um, that's being shown at a place called Wonder Spaces. Uh, Wonder Spaces uh, has a few locations around the country, and uh, this is a pretty large room. And um, at Wonder Spaces right now, you walk up to a wall and you, you see this and, and uh, run different kinds of uh, lighting through it to where it feels like it's a sunrise or a sunset. But the beautiful thing is we, we've been experimenting with walking through it and it feels so strange to walk through it because it, it's actually up above your waist and um, you feel like you're really, really big. And if you don't see anything on the edges, you know, you really feel like you're flying and you, uh, some people are nervous about walking because they don't know, is there a place to step? You know, am I going to fall into the abyss of the earth? Um, it's also really beautiful when you do get on your hands and knees and you get slightly below it, uh, just the way it all sort of looks. And this kind of gives you a sense of when, when you are in it, it produces these beautiful shadows um, uh, that when you're behind the person that's, in, in, uh, with, uh, that's casting the shadow, it, it becomes really dramatic. So uh, Wonder Spaces is working on ways in which we can do this so that it doesn't uh, produce a whole bunch of lines that would, nobody can come into it, uh, and it can also be safe. Uh, but this is the, um, uh, one of the websites, so you can go do that. We call it Experiment 2C because uh, there's been a few different versions of, of this. And then just finally, um, uh, this is called the Museum of the Future. It's in Dubai, and um, that was a rendering, but this is a real photo. And it's this crazy, crazy museum uh, to help you think about the future. And uh, if you've ever met a futurist, you know that they tend to be like really depressing people because they talk about all the bad things that uh, can happen in the future, <laughs> which are true, right? There's all sorts of, with, uh, with the environment, you know, right now, like there's all sorts of bad things that can happen. Who knows what's going to happen with artificial intelligence and robotics and all these different things that are coming to the future. But what was amazing is the sort of the brainchild behind this, Noah Radford, um, was saying, you know, we are going to look Head, take these, these things head on, and we're going to produce environments that allow you to imagine a future that we want to be in. And so it's not a museum that you just go look at stuff up on the wall. It's really an experiential museum. And uh, this was, oh, I, I didn't get the last picture in there. But um, um, this, whole, this whole thing lights up. It's super beautiful. You should look it up. It hasn't opened yet. So I can't show you what uh, what we're producing inside, but um, I'm working on on an area where we're thinking about objects of the future, and so it's been really fun to be able to think about well, what is the future that I want to have, versus like the future that, you know, if we just don't do anything is going to happen, and then you know have re look at the realistic technology that might come to pass and infuse that into this, this world that you'll walk through. And the hope is the whole region, the whole world will go through this and be inspired about the future that they want to create. So I'm just going to show one last thing. Um, you're going to have to play with me a little bit here. Um, you're going to have to close your eyes for a second, okay? So close your eyes because I'm going to transport you to a different room here <laughs> in a second. 
and uh, I'm going to show you something that is another cloud, but it's a cloud chamber. This is something called a cloud chamber, and it really is like a fish tank with, um, with some other stuff. And so what I have is there's a metal plate on top of here, and underneath I have some dry ice. I always like dry ice, right? And uh, so it's super cold. You want to make sure you wear your gloves. So this is underneath of a metal plate. And then inside the fish tank, I put isopropyl alcohol. And if you Google cloud chamber, you can find a bunch of different videos on this. This is just the way I've done it. So you put some isopropyl alcohol in here. You turn the fish tank upside down. You make it really cold down there. And after a little while, you'll see a little fog. And so there's fog that's about, you know, about that high up from the, the base and it's just kind of going like this. And it's not the fog that's most important. It's actually little streaks. You'll see these little teeny streaks as if they're like, well, I don't have very much hair, but uh, <laughs> like little hairline streaks going through this thing. And these streaks are particles that have come from exploded stars and they've been flying through space and some of them get to our solar system and some of them get to Earth and some of them get to Los Angeles and some of them are flying through right this second and are gonna smash into this thing and for a fraction of a second, you'll see something that is invisible, but it's made visible by this. And if you remember from high school, of course I slept through this class, but I was told <laughs> that our bodies are made of atoms. Atoms that used to be in a star that exploded. And then there was another star that exploded and another star exploded. And all this dust, all these atoms just kind of went all over the place. And at some point, a bunch of them bumped into each other, smashed and smashed, and it became big. And then it became hot. And that became our sun. Some of the other atoms, some of the other dust, smashed together and it became our planets and asteroids and comets. Some atoms on Earth became water or the fish or the animals, but it just so happens at this moment in galactic history, some of these atoms have become you. Some of them have become me. It is a gift and a privilege to be alive. What you do matters. What you do matters. What we all do together matters. And it's things like this that when I wake up in the morning, it just kind of whispers this little voice inside of my head and it asks, what are you doing? What are you doing with your brief moment in time?